everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to TPA Global's webinar on Global Tax Controversy Management, where I will speak on this theme specifically about companies in the digital economy sector. I am Avisha Sood, a senior manager with the TPA Global based in Amsterdam, and I will be your presenter for today. I will talk in, in today's presentation, I will talk of, after a little bit of an introduction, we will talk about uh, what are the typical disputes that concern companies in this sector, some companies that are, full, that are offering fully digital value chains versus those companies that are still offering traditional products and services that are evolving with digitalization, their way of providing those products and services. Then we will talk about what are the currently seen unilateral or as well as global measures taken by various countries and international bodies to tackle the taxation of digital economy, a complex item that many of us are still trying to get our heads around. Thereafter, we will address what does dispute avoidance versus dispute resolution mean? which is uh, how long does either of those processes take, which instruments are available under each, and what is our recommendation to you if you are trying to prevent a dispute or resolve them. Uh, we will then close with some uh, final highlights and open the floor for questions. Um, a note to everyone who is joining, uh, you will have a chat box or a message box on your screens. In case of any questions, please feel free to type them on the chat box. However, as I mentioned, we will address the questions towards the end of the presentation. But please feel free to type them in as you think of. Excuse me, as you think of any. Uh, another point, uh, the slides of this presentation as well as the recording will be made available to all attendees after the presentation. With this, we we'll start with an introduction to why we have chosen this topic today to talk about global tax controversy management. So, do all of you agree, have disputes increased? Well, I for one think so. But let's begin the presentation with a few words from the man of the hour for now. Well, as a result of that project or not, we have certainly seen an increase and a rise in the number of disputes that multinationals are facing today. And these are not limited to uh, those companies that are impacted by digitalization. Companies with traditional business models are impacted alike. So much so that as of 2017, we even set up our global tax controversy management practice. And our view is we can think of disputes in three main categories. When some traditional structures are being challenged, that is your existing arrangements are being challenged. For instance, all of you are aware about the recent state aid judgments. Another uh, area that's leading to disputes is unknown in the field of tax before, an element of personal liability for, uh, the, for tax personnel uh, uh, is being introduced in many leg countries' legislations, coupled with excessive reporting requirements. And last but not the least, and the main topic of today's discussion that is leading to disputes amongst my, between tax authorities and multinationals is the changing business models as a result of digitalization. So this first topic we will be covering our uh, first topic of dispute that is the traditional structures. We will be covering in another informative webinar towards the end of October. If you, in case any of you would like to join, we have an excellent panel talking about these disputes in light of the recent Starbucks and Fiat judgment. As a the next dispute uh, element that I mentioned to you, which relates to excessive reporting requirements and an element of personal liability. It invariably sets the scene for uh, tax having a place in the boardroom and how to make sure tax get that, get that place, how to make sure business and tax are talking not at the time of implementation of changes, but at the time of strategically thinking the changes. If you think if, uh, this situation seems familiar to you, come join us for a workshop in Amsterdam, uh, details of which you can find on the link uh, on the website for now, uh, on the screen for now. Which brings us to our 
current topic of discussion that disputes relating to changing business models. These are of two types. Changing business models can be digitalization of existing business models. Let's say, for example, you were a brick and mortar business producing something and selling it via different shops set up in different countries. And now you decide to do it via a website or a globally controlled omnichannel model. So how to explain this change in rem how to explain this change in remuneration leading to different EBIT margins to the tax authorities in the countries of your distributors, which were sort of expecting a range of a margin coming their way before this change. Or another type of changing business models are a new stream of companies that have come up which offer fully digitalized services. Say for example, a platform economy, think, uh, think of companies such as Uber or companies such as Netflix here as a list of examples that have contracts in the back with suppliers as their own investment have made up a platform where these suppliers' services can be or content can be offered to buyers at the front. Whereas these are very asset light industries that are essentially providing services of connecting persons, providing a service of, or product to the ones wanting to buy it. These are the ones that are even more complex than the first ones to understand in terms of value chain and therefore to understand in terms of what and where to tax. So today we will talk about these in terms of how different are the value chains of these companies different from the well-known model of voters as shown on the slides as of now. And we will talk about these in context of what new legislations are coming up which countries are basing their legislations on what types of principles and how do they impact companies working or uh, yeah, active in these countries. With this, we will start with what kind of disputes surround um, digital economy companies, whether they are uh, digitalizing fully or partly their business model or those that run on a pure digital stream. Let's say if we talk about a company in the apparel industry that used to first, in the, on the top you see the value chain that it ha used to have before digitalization, where it would first design the content and design, create the designs based on its own market research. Then it would uh, do some procurement of raw materials, manufacture the products, store them appropriately, make sure they're transported to all possible stores that are well located in terms of uh, customer reach and market uh, and uh, market uh, site. And at the uh, at the stores, they would do different kinds of promotions to make sure more and more customers visit their stores and buy products from them. However, after uh, the impact of digitalization, even companies in as traditional as apparel industry, like everyone's still going to go and buy clothes, even something as um, uh, unchangeable has noticed quite a bit significant change in its value chain. To begin with, instead of creating designs through big data and through just analysis of um, runway trends, these companies have reduced their time of creating designs for manufacturing products to half. Secondly, the the element of manufacturing which required quite a bit of significant time and people is being done quite quickly through use of a lot of artificial intelligence. Next comes uh, the bringing these products to the market side which is done more and more so via website sales. So website sales can be carried out at any place in the world and therefore the companies, these companies not need to maintain inventories or warehouses in each and every location. They can have one centralized warehouse covering many regions and only sufficient inventory of products is kept uh, in a, on a real-time basis, meaning thereby that <coughs> excuse me, only that many clothes or products are kept 
of the, uh, the sale of which can really be anticipated via the website uh, future sales made. Now, if in this kind of company, because of a lot of cost savings, earlier there could be a markup applied on production, a markup on, say, warehousing, markup on distribution, because there were many different personnel involved at each level. Therefore, the margins to be made at each level were quite high. Coming to, these, so coming to the efficiencies brought in by digitalization, this industry has seen quite a significant reduction in the EBIT margins made overall. So what we have seen as a common dispute in companies or industries such as these, that let's say you had a sales um, arm of the company, excuse me, for which you had entered into an advanced pricing agreement with the local tax authority fixing their um, arm's length margin to be, say, for instance, 2% of the local sales. And let's say you said this in 2014, at which point 2% of local sales perhaps did not account to too much in your overall EBIT margin when, it was, when your overall EBIT margin was 12%. But let's say the APA was for five years, come five years, and your uh, pre-tax EBIT margin is only reduced to half, which means that the 2% uh, of local sales commission that was being given to the local sales uh, agent contributes, uh, constitutes the twice the amount it did five years ago as a fraction of your overall EBIT. Did, had you, uh, had you not had an APA, but since you had an APA, the tax authorities are expecting you to provide that much, uh, provide that much margin to the local agent and tax that lo uh, margin in the hands of the local agent. So, so yes, so this is leading to quite of, quite often uh, some disputes in the minds of. Uh, in the hands of tax authorities in these local uh, of the country of the local sales agent because they had agreed on an APA whereby they were expecting a certain margin to come to them but due to changes in the value chain that margin giving that margin to the local sales agent is no longer possible for the company so in this case although APAs are known to be quite a good controversy management instrument but in this case would you say that would you use APA for sales and marketing um, arm of your business? We'll discuss it towards the, when we come to dispute avoidance and resolution instruments in a bit more in detail. Another example of um, disputes that can be seen in the, in the business models of companies that are on their way to digitalizing is um, let's say let's see it in the example of an automotive industry. So the parts in black here explain the traditional models, traditional value streams of automotive industries, and the ones in red explain what has changed in terms after digitalization has come up. As you can see, there's a lot more focus on collection of customer data, interpretation of such data, and uh, improvements being made to the manufacturing process through this data, and uh, the ultimate service being provided to the customer being improved because of um, because of data collected directly from the car, from the automobile. However, this presents a question that is. Uh, that many tax authorities or governments in the world are struggling with. What, import, what level of importance should be associated with this data? Is this just mere, is mere collection of data, uh, is just mere collection of data can qualify it as an intangible? Or just mere collection of data be thought of as a service only? So, here we see uh, here we see disputes of two kinds. So one is whether just mere collection of data is an intangible, and if so, 
even the car distributors or the after sales service providers were always collecting data from their customers in order to keep improving their services. Now, just because a software is being used to collect data from customers, does that mean that this collection of data automatically becomes an intangible in the hands of the company and should be remunerated with a royalty rather than a cost plus 5% return, which was being provided to the data collection activity performed by sales and after sales service providers in the value chain of the automobile industry? So in order to tackle disputes of this kind, we, uh, we totally recommend to draw up a matrix uh, such as the one we show on the screen here. This is made specifically for an automobile industry, but if you look at the columns on the top, the recording of data, internal transfer of data for processing, extraction, quality control, and ultimately exploitation by putting it in some sellable form. These uh, attributes can be commonly applied to all companies that collect data from their customers and use it to enhance their service offerings. However, as was the case before, should remain the case even after digitalization that just because a software is being used to collect data should not automatically qualify it as an intangible. Thus, development of data, enhancement of it, and storage of it should still remain routine activities because these are routine for the business from the point of view of their value chains. Now, to increase the, now to increase the complexity of what to tax, what is an tangible element or an entity that can be taxed comes the completely digital value chain. Let's say if we look at the value chain of a web streaming service, it doesn't exactly fit into the Porter's model, but let's say for now we try to analyze what would be the inbound logistics, outbound logistics, etc., of such a service. So as I mentioned before, such uh, platform economy companies need a huge network of providers. So for a web streaming service, the inbound logistics providers would be licenses from um, TV or movie um, content creators. Operations would be to make up a website through which, or an app or a platform through which these, uh, this content can be shown to users perhaps collection of data from users uh, uh, to identify what kind of things they want to see so that the platform can be optimized, could be part of operations. Next, on the outbound logistics side, what is needed is having a huge network of viewers or the people wanting to consume the service would lie on this outbound logistics side. Sales and marketing, and uh, sales and marketing, a typical process that would be given to one or more entities within a group does not really apply to these companies because most of their marketing and sales activities are carried out via online channels, not necessarily restricted to or by one entity. And the same can be said for uh, services or support, which is uh, quite often provided directly via the app or through an intelligent assistant on the website and has rather limited involvement of people in employed by one entity. Before we analyze issues of such a value chain, let's look at just another one of a similar type where we talk about value chains of a mobility service provider who again on its inbound logistic side needs a network of uh, car providers that can come from manufacturers, drivers, distributors, um, you name it. As operations, again, they would just need from their side to develop an app or a service or a sorry, a website which can keep uh, which can keep providing the service, which can keep linking the these providers of uh, providers of automobiles to the people wanting to move from point A to point B. 
and the sales and marketing and service activities remain the same for this industry as well as they were for the uh, streaming industry. So if you were to look at these value chains, the main element is the main element of um, value creation is creation of the website. Uh, once a website has been created, once a website has been created, the there is not that many asset involvement. So these are very asset light industries, and these asset light industries are really beyond the comprehension of digital of tax authorities because they cannot think of they they are used to taxing an entity in their country now with these companies there are fewer as few assets and fewer entities owning such assets and fewer local presence of these entities can be seen in any country at all so this is confusing the tax authorities of many countries as well as internationally and they are focusing on only one item because that's what they can tangibly place their hands on that is users so if we try to see in the portal then the value chains of companies could be divided into portals value chain each of the element of inbound logistics operations outbound logistics etc could be linked to one or more entities and those entities could be taxed in a geographical location or one or more geographical locations due now due to lack of number of entities within a group due to lack of number of um, tangible items within a group that can be seen uh, by the tax authorities the only item they can see in their country is users which is why they are starting to bring up more and more taxes claiming user participation or claim that tax the revenue generated from these users this um, this presents a it this presents quite a complex problem of uh, the tax laws not being aligned with the value chains of multinational companies so as we mentioned digitalization has impacted companies in the way that they have tried to bring in efficiencies in their business they have tried to reduce cost of doing business they have tried to make services more accessible to their consumers but the tax authorities have not evolved to this extent to be able to understand these changes they still want a brick and mortar establishment that they can go to and uh, that they can go to and place the tax on this is what is seen in many uni uh, almost all unilateral as well as uh, global measures uh, we will not spend that much time on talking about these the measures brought in by oecd and eu cause uh, or the unilateral companies but just an Im uh, overall impact these legislations have so if we look at um, OECD through its pillar one, as it announced earlier this year in March, it said um, three main items to tax on: user participation, marketing intangibles, significant economic presence. Um, yesterday, they talk, they talk about a unified approach, uh, in unified approach which through which these three items can be linked. But the draft consultation document is yet to be seen. What shall what may come of it? Next is EU proposals, which came, which propose a three percent short-term measure proposed a three percent tax, and a long-term measure like the OECD proposed a significant digital presence tax, a tax based on significant digital presence. And um, another uh, proposal floating in the EU is of that is that of CCTB, which simply are, states that profit should be distributed based on a formulary apportionment one third of sales one third of people and one third of assets should be taken into account for this classification none of these proposals have yet been accepted and uh, since uh, there's not like an agreement of eu member countries on these proposals they have come up with several laws several uh, individual unilateral measures of their own uh, the only commonality that is to be seen amongst all of these legislations is the fact that all of these place a tax on revenue. None of these place a tax on profit, but mostly on revenue. This is this is the uh, element that is completely 
not aligned with the value chains of companies what you generate as revenue is is going is not a, is not something that you are going to pay corporate income tax on all of our model tax treaties all of our oecd tp guidelines are based on this principle that even the tax treaty state that it's a convention on um disputes arising from income and capital so all of the dispute resolution and avoidance measures mentioned in the tax treaties only relate to disputes on taxation of income not on taxation of revenue so because of all of these measures unilateral or global what will happen when companies what will happen when companies get into disputes with tax authorities applying these measures would they be able to even claim protection of the tax treaty it's a there's a big question mark in that question um so this oh actually yeah, okay before we move up the before we move on then to uh, the dis different dispute avoidance and resolution measures still available to companies we have a slide on what are the commonalities between these three measures but i think we've spoken about it enough that one is leading to change of balance in power in the favor of source jurisdiction usually all the uh, tax treaties had been brought up had been uh, designed with the principle of uh, where the in the countries where the investment in and um, in the development of let's say intangibles or the capital investment concerning tangibles has been made the returns should flow to that jurisdiction the majority of the returns should flow to that jurisdiction and only returns that can be related to sales or carried out in another source jurisdiction can be taxed in such a source jurisdiction but these new legislations are providing uh, are providing excessive rights uh, to source jurisdictions excessive only because uh, they are not necessarily trying to quantify the profit that is being made in the source jurisdiction but only the revenue that is being derived from these jurisdictions another uh this concept brings us to the next part which is on dispute avoidance versus dispute resolution so if you look at the uh, the the table the chart on the slides it explains what proactive measures of risk management to avoid disputes versus what reactive measures to resolve disputes once they have arisen can be taken by um, multinational companies if we talk for a minute this, uh, about dispute resolution first while the, this has evolved quite a bit ever since the uh, from the old article 25 that was present in the model tax treaties to the changes made by MLI and if you are in the EU to the uh, through the European Arbitration Convention a lot of improvements uh, certainly have been made in the dispute resolution process but it still remains an extremely time consuming process for instance if we take the example of the European Arbitration Convention which is uh, which is applicable to transfer pricing disputes as well within the European Union was introduced as a measure to provide timely relief and it contained um it contained a, a time feature which stated that uh, double taxation has to be avoided uh, within 2 years of a complaint being accepted under the uh, under the European Arbitration Convention and if uh, an agreement cannot be reached after 2 years uh, a supervisory body has to be appointed in order to resolve the dispute uh, in a speedy manner however uh, one of the first cases that was filed under the european arbitration convention concerned then concerned the country of denmark where the taxpayer had a dispute that started in 2011 end of 2011 in after a few rounds of discussions that went with the uh, danish tax authorities for about 2 years in 2014 early 2014 the taxpayer decided to file for ask the danish tax authorities to give them access to european arbitration convention for a map procedure 
the Danish Tax authorities kept asking for back and forth rounds of information from the ta from the taxpayer, and this back and forth round of information went on for a year. After which, the Danish tax authorities refused access to the taxpayer, stating that sufficient information in sufficient time had not been provided. Well, ultimately, the Danish High Court did overrule uh, the tax authorities' uh, views and ruled in favor of the taxpayer that they should get access to the European Arbitration Convention. But that was only in 2016. So the taxpayer tried to get access in 2014 and was only approved, its request to get access was only approved in 2016, let alone a resolution. So that's why we mentioned in, even with these changes, trying to really come to a resolution of a dispute is more than three to five years, depending on which country you're dealing with. And therefore, you should, as, as a company, try to be proactive in your dispute management process. Uh, here's an example of uh, Procter & Gamble, which through its proactive approach through some 17 or 18 APAs with different uh, countries, mostly bilateral, have been able to reduce their provisioning reserves to one-fourth of the total amount from which they started. Therefore, this is a quantified uh, benefit that can come to you if you have adopt a proactive approach towards uh, dispute management and instead of waiting for uh, disputes to arise and only deal with them in, at the stage of resolution. And therefore, we would like uh, we present to you what's our viewpoint on how to build up your roadmap for dispute avoidance. And it starts with understanding and explaining to tax authorities as well as your internal stakeholders your value chains. So, uh, after that, uh, apologies. After that, the addition of value chain to master files has become a norm by the OECD and OECD following countries. So, when, so, in 2016 was the first time when companies started to make their draw up their value chain uh, for putting it for the purpose of putting it in their uh, master files. However, it, uh, it may have started as a process for just a compliance requirement, but uh, keeping in mind the, change, the changing value chains or the evolving value chains year by year, especially due to digitalization, their companies should try to also quantify their value chains. At the same time, when they when they uh, make a qualitative description for their documentation purposes, even simple quantification mechanisms such as uh, such as the ones shown on the table on the uh, slide here, where you first quantify the amount of routine activities and keep a keep a total reserve keep a total of what is the residual remaining and who are the entities that have a share of the residual even if we do not go on to further qualify quantify the residual among these entities if you do this is basic homework on identifying which are the routine entities how much is the residual and which are the entities really that can be claiming this residual it's already a lot of good prep work that can give you a lot of ammunition in case of questions coming your way from the tax authority. After you have done your value chain analysis from a qualitative and quantitative point of view, your next point should be to identify your high risk countries. An obvious way to do so is, of course, to think of uh, where you have faced an audit before or which countries take the longest time to resolve. Um, to resolve a case, but you should also take into account uh, the new regulations all of these countries are coming up with. So this just presents um, that most of the unilateral measures seen by countries, well, of course, they favor the country, they favor the country that is bringing out that unilateral measure, and mo which is mostly the country of souls. You've seen mostly the unilateral measures coming out of countries that, do, that are not, um, the headquarters or home base of most multinationals, but only a source jurisdiction where the users of the services of these companies lie. 
Beth, uh, Beth started to, through the Beth project, OECD started to amend existing guidance. And the existing guidance earlier was in the favor of destination countries. But as now, if you look at more and more recent uh, reports of uh, the BEPS project, also after the, in also with the participation of the countries in the inclusive framework, the balance of power is again tilting towards the source country. But it's got, there are still some countries like the EU Digital Economy Proposals or the CCCTP that are still holding on to very legalistic ways of division of profit as well as taxing of profit. Both the BEPS project as well as unilateral measures are at least focusing on how and where value is created and are just struggling with finding a way to attribute correct, inco uh, correct income for taxation. Whereas the EU digital economy proposals and CCCTV are still holding on to the legalistic approach of uh, apportioning the profit in two or three brackets and applying that to even the digital economy companies, which seems rather unreasonable. So after you've done your value chain analysis, the point is you should do a country-wide analysis of wherever you have uh, wherever you have your operations to identify what is really the political um, uh, motive of these countries and what kind of legislations they have come up with or what kind of legislations they have in their pipeline to come out in the next coming uh, year as a next step would be after you're done, after you show about what is really your value chain and which of the new regulations really impact you, the next step would then be to select an appropriate dispute avoidance instrument. This slide here shows which types of instruments are typically applicable to uh, bringing certainty on which parts of the value chain. Like for instance, it says here, that manufacturing and sales could benefit from having multilateral or unilateral APAs. But if you recall an example we talked about in an earlier slide, if these uh, an AP, if you have an APA, but if you have a very evolving business model, that is your value chain is going to be completely different in the next three to five years, then perhaps APA is not the best way for you to go forward. So while selecting your uh, controversy management instrument, you shouldn't just look at historical data of what has been accepted before. You should first start with what is your value chain now and what is your value chain going to be in the next three to five years. If you do, do not see significant changes, only then should you go for some certain long-term measures such as APS. After carefully choosing an instrument that that, that uh, brings certainty to um, different parts of your value chain, uh, you should then think about making sure all the all all your outside reporting, all the reporting to the outside world, is done correctly. Be it your master file or local files or corporate income tax returns or VAT returns, they should all ideally be telling the same story, because otherwise all of this prep work that you would have done in terms of making your value chain, coming up with like a um, controversy management instrument, if it is not reflected well in your story to the outside world, you can still be at a risk of dispute because your two different documents filed in two different countries were just telling a completely different story. So for this purpose, we uh, provide a three-step process of how to make sure you have globally consistent documentation filed everywhere. As a next step to making sure you have globally consistent uh, reporting, uh, reporting everywhere, uh, this slide presents only an illustration of what can be done from a tax transformer for a tax DP framework, but this kind of framework can be applied for all of your uh, reportings. What this essentially presents is that you should use a governance model whereby responsibility for each reporting should be divided in layers. So, uh, divided in layers across the organization. And the, 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 the um, sorry, and the, 
um, explanation of what goes out should be controlled from the center, like a policy should be set by the center as to whenever a change to a business happens, that should be reported back to the center. And uh, this is a customi customizable uh, framework that a company can adopt to show what level of control should rest with center and what level of control should rest with locals. This is quite helpful in ensuring that there is consistency amongst what the local what the local entities go out and file, and that and um, in making sure that it is aligned with the central policies on reporting. Um, after uh, even after ensuring that uh, all your reportings are consistent. There's one more element that you should take into account, which could possibly still lead you to disputes. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of, uh, say, Lux Leak Papers, Panama Leak Papers, or the case of Caterpillar, which got into dispute due to a whistleblower. So, communication to the outside world is important, but communication to the in your in-house teams, to your employees is very important as well because if they do not have faith in your tax policies excuse me if they do not have faith in your tax policies that can itself be a reason for you to get be getting into disputes therefore first it should be effective communication outside but it should also be very efficient communication to people inside your company thus for an effective dispute avoidance mechanism, you should start with getting a grip on your value chains, making sure you have your high-risk countries identified and your value chains, or value chains of entities or presence in those countries solidified even further. As a next step, you should choose a dispute avoidance instrument carefully and um, only you should choose something as certain as APA if your value chains are going to be the same for the next few years. Uh, as a next step, you should think about reporting. Uh, as a next step, you should think about reporting your returns in a globally consistent manner. And as last but not the least, as you mentioned, uh, managing your in-house challenges is not something you should forget if you would really like to protect yourself from getting into disputes. As we move to uh, as we move towards the end of this presentation, we talk, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how to design your own controversy management decision tree. So through all of this, uh, through all of these slides that we have seen today, a couple of things are consistent. That if you have a good grip on your value chain. If you understand your business well, and if you have the data analytics to explain it to someone outside as well, then even if you are getting into disputes or questions from tax authorities, it's quite likely that you will be able to you will be able to avoid a dispute with them. So, what we recommend is if you have either questions or anticipated questions from tax authorities in like previous years. Uh, before you enter into your intercompany transactions, uh, you should try to run them through. Because when you would attend your BCA, you would have had to run quite a few data analytics. So if you get questions from tax authorities on, um, let's say, how much value, how much um, profit is allocated to local operations, you should first try to find the answer through your. Um, BCA data analytics conducted at, uh, as, a, as step one of your dispute management uh, framework. If you can already find an answer and provide them uh, quantified data, quite likely, and maintain an open and honest communication with them, quite likely they will accept your argumentation and you will not need a controversy instrument unless so you get into an audit for a future year. If you do not, uh, if the questions asked by the tax authorities are uh, not readily answerable by you because of um, lack of preparedness, because of uh, aggressiveness of the tax authorities, then you should consider adopting a controversy management instrument on your value chain. Another test to 
keep into mind when selecting a controversy management instrument is what is the level of content that's required to be given to a tax authority in order to get an agreement. If you remember the case we talked about uh, in respect of European Arbitration Convention with the Danish tax authorities, uh, the level of content that was required by the Danish tax authorities was so excessive that it could not possibly be provided by the taxpayer, and that was one of the reasons for them to get for them to not be granted access to the European Arbitration Convention. So therefore, if you try. You should then try to check whether what level of content is really required. What we quite often use as a benchmark is uh, the content that's required by the ICAP program of the OECD. So OECD is setting at an international level of standard of what can be accepted, uh, what can be expected by tax authorities in order to give you certainty on your on taxes to be paid in their jurisdictions. So if a local tax authority wants you to submit uh, rounds and rounds of data of uh, information that is even more than that required by the ICAP, perhaps that instrument is not worth going down that road for you. Uh, same about timeline. If, uh, say, for example, in countries like USA, it takes quite a long time to get an APA, sometimes up to five years. So you spend five years getting an APA, and by the end of that time, your whole value chain looks so different from when you started that that APA is of no use. So again, <coughs> the process or the process or the timeline associated with um, such instrument being applied or being active for you, activated for you rather, uh, should be taken into account before you select uh, such a mechanism. Uh, these controversy management decision trees have to be customized uh, per company, per entity, um, not entity, per group, uh, but they can differ in, by industry by industry. They can differ based on which countries you have presence, what's the political climate on these kind of these countries, so and so on. But some elements remain the same: that if you have a good grip on your value chain, both from a qualitative and quantitative point of view, that is that lies at the heart of each dispute avoidance instrument, this uh, dispute management instrument. With um, that, we come towards uh, the end of this presentation. Thank you very much for attending, and uh, I hope to see you at another webinar. Thank you very much.